Welcome one and all. Let's invite the Lord. Be with us, Lord. Open our eyes, our ears, our hearts and our minds. Teach us what we most need to know, that life might be full and blessed and overflowing. Amen. We've been studying Passion Week, and the last time we were here, we noticed how our Lord was asked, what is the greatest commandment? In other words, what is religion all about? May I remind you of his answer. It's in the end of Matthew 22. Jesus answered, Love the Lord. Notice the first word. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like unto it, love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Notice our Lord is saying that all religion hangs on the one theme, love. Love to God, love to God's creatures. That is the essence of religion. Anything else is bad religion. You know, the Jews counted 613 commandments in the Torah, first five books of the Bible. And our Lord finds two of them that nowhere in the Old Testament are said to be the greatest. But with his wonderful genius, he picks them out. Love God with all you've got, that's first. Love your neighbour as yourself, that's like unto it. That's the second. And on these hang everything else. So no religion is genuine. No religion is worth a cent unless it teaches love to God and man. And when we talk about love to our neighbour, the word love has been so abused by Hollywood. Think of it as unerring kindness, patient, enduring kindness which none of us find easy. For all of us know our brothers and our sisters as the tide knows the way by the rocks that bar the path. So the second greatest commandment is to be kind to all you meet because inasmuch as we do it under one of the least of these, we do it under Christ. Magnificent summary of true religion. You know, the true test of religion is right there. And the second test is its results on the religious person. Is it wings or is it weight? Does your religion carry you or do you have to carry your religion? Does your religion give you joy or does it depress you? We need to examine our religion because most religion in the world is bad religion. And for this reason, there are many atheists. But you know, you never see a counterfeit $13 bill. Counterfeits only exist where there is a genuine. Counterfeit religion only exists because there is a genuine religion and it's about kindness, compassion, sympathy, goodness. Remember the sun is a million times bigger than the earth. That's the importance of God compared to our hopes, fears, ambitions, possessions. A million times more important. So true religion must be realistic and <laughs> give God his place and realise whatever we do to our neighbour, we do to God. So in one sense, the two commandments are one. Because whatever I do to my spouse, my son, my daughter, my neighbour, my friend at church, whatever I do to any one of them, I am doing to God. So there's only one commandment. Kindness, love, compassion, Sympathy, they're all variants of the same thing. Notice how our Lord then (coughs) turns the tables on his questioners and he asks them a question. We're in verse 41 of 
chapter 22 of Matthew. <clears throat> While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. Old Testament said that. He said, How is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, and now he quotes Psalm 110, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit on my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, the Messiah, how can the Messiah be David's son? And of course the only answer is that David's Messiah is God the Son. So I durst not ask him any more questions. Now we come on the most terrible series of denunciations to be found anywhere in the Bible. <clears throat> and they're all aimed not at atheists, not at agnostics, they're all aimed at religious people. But religious people with the wrong religion. Religious people whose religions are weight, not wings. Whose religion is not good, glad and merry tidings that make the feet to dance and the heart to sing. That's an oppressive weight. You know, the most pathetic, the most poignant fact in human experience is that most people have a view of religion that is drudgery, a grind and slavery. Who wants a religion like that? Not me, not you. But most people think of religion as a drudgery, a grind, a slavery. Whereas true religion is a revelry, it is an ecstasy, it is a rejoicing, it's an everlasting song. If we don't have that, we don't have the Christian religion. You say, but it's tough. It says we've got to give up this, we've got to give up that, we've got to do this and we do that. God asks us to give up nothing that would be in our best interest to keep. The only things he asks us to surrender are those over which we stumble and that hinder our heavenward way. So here's a chapter addressed to religious people, but people with the wrong religion. And we need to examine our own hearts. <clears throat> Remember our Lord is breaking the shackles of the religious leaders over the people. The people had too much of a reverence for tradition. They had too much respect for leaders. Now, shouldn't we respect religious leaders? Yes, if they manifest the fruit of the Spirit. And if it's obvious that God has given to them of the gifts of the Spirit. Otherwise, they're not God-appointed leaders. And there are many men in religion today who use religion as a business. I remember writing to the head of one denomination in this country, saying many of the leaders in this group are idolaters without knowing it. They give the church more respect than God. You see, the church is only like a telescope. You don't look at a telescope, you look through it. And the church has no value in and of itself. It only exists so that one day it won't exist. The church is like a missionary society. Missionary societies exist, so one day there won't be any need for missionary societies. The gospel will have gone to all the world. In the last book of the Bible, John looks around and he says, I didn't see a church there. There's no church there. Of course not. The church is not an end in itself. The conflict between Christ and the Pharisees, Christ and Caiaphas, happens in every generation. In every generation the church needs a waking up. In every generation the church falls asleep. In every generation the church becomes Laodicean. Lukewarm, increased with goods, 
thinks it's got need of nothing. So God sends a time bomb or two in the person of people who want to refer the church to what the scriptures teach. And so we have this conflict continually echoing the conflict between Christ and Caiaphas. And Caiaphas had 20,000 servants all being paid by the tithe. They didn't want to leave Caiaphas. And so in every generation when there's a call for revival in the church only a minority will heed it. A small boy once protested to his mother, why have I got to have a bath today? I had one yesterday. She said, because you're dirty again. You've got a bath every day, son. And that's the way it is with churches. They've got to have a revival constantly. That was the motto of the reformers, always reforming. So let's look now at the most severe denunciations to be found anywhere in the Bible and directed at religionists of the wrong shade. People who turned religion into a weight instead of wings, into drudgery instead of a revelry. You know, what could be better than to know that you're in tune with the universe. God is on your side. He doesn't count your mistakes as long as he has your heart. That he counts you as accepted in the beloved, complete in Christ. What could be better than that? So let's look at it. Chapter 23. <coughs> Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. You must obey them, do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do. They don't practice what they preach. So he's saying, inasmuch as religious leaders go by the writings of scripture, follow them. No further. No further. This chapter will use the term hypocrites over and over. And you know, at first we're inclined to say, oh, that's terrible. But there is a sense in which we are all hypocrites. Every one of us likes to appear better than we actually are. There are no exceptions. But he's talking here about the out-and-out -out hypocrites. Let's look at it. <coughs> don't do what they do. They don't practice what they preach. They tie heavy burdens put them on men's shoulders, they themselves not willing to lift a finger to move them. When as a boy I read this, I thought that's wonderful. True religion's not a load. True religion's not a burden. True religion's wings, not weight. Joy, not depression. Ecstasy, not sadness. But the Pharisees' religion full of heavy burdens. Everything they do is to be for men to see. They make their phylacteries wide. Phylacteries were little boxes that contained some verses from the Old Testament which were bound on the back of the hands and wrists and on the forehead because about four times in the Old Testament the Jews were told, write my law so it'll be a frontlet between your eyes. Write it on your hands so it'll guide in everything you do. It was illustration. It wasn't meant to be taken literally. You know, there are a lot of people who know the Bible that don't know the Bible. They take it so literally. It can be very dangerous. Jews betrayed his Lord, go there and do likewise. Hang all the law on the prophets. That's scripture. When you read it in context, it's a little different. It's not enough to know the Bible. You must understand the Bible. The Bible says if you be circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. Probably most men here are circumcised. But if you're doing it in order to earn brownie points, Christ will profit you nothing. So these phylacteries, they took literally the Old Testament admonition about write the law so you can see and so you'll do. And this casts light on Revelation 13 when it talks about the mark of the beast because it talks about those who receive a mark on their foreheads or in their hands. That tells us that whatever the mark of the beast is, it has to do with the law of God. And because the key word in that chapter is 
worship. They worship the beast, they worship his image. But whatever the mark of the beast is, it has to do with the law of God and it has to do with worship. And surrounding verses tell us it has to do with acknowledging God as creator. So the phylacteries were literalised by the Jews and the tassels on their garments long. The Lord told them, make a fringe of blue. When you look at it, look at it, you think of heavenly things. So they made them very long, very wide. But they weren't very heavenly. They loved the place of honour at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogue. They loved to be greeted in the marketplaces, to have men call them rabbi, which means great one. You're not to be called rabbi, you have only one master. You're all brothers. That's a wonderful text, isn't it? You are all brothers. There's no hierarchy in the true church of God. The true church is not a denomination. The true church is the church invisible. It's composed of all the twice born. And in that church, we are all brethren and sisters. That's it. We may be appointed different tasks, but we're all equal in the sight of God. Don't call anyone on earth father. You have to be careful about literalising that. Most of us have called our dad's dad. But it means spiritual father. And of course the church has violated that for 2,000 years. And it's so plain. You have one father and he's in heaven. Nor are you to be called teacher, for you have one teacher, the Christ. The greatest among you will be your servant. How different the history of the church would have been if this council had been taken. There would have been no priestly usurpation. There would have been no inquisition. There would have been no religious persecution. There would not have been millions of people bowing to a minority and calling them their spiritual father. What a different history the church would have had. Christ is our only priest. Christ is our only prophet. Christ is our only king. Christ is our only master. We may listen to others, but Christ always has the last word, the correcting word. Woe to you, teachers of law and, uh, and Pharisees, hypocrites. You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourselves don't enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to you. Many translations have eight woes in this chapter, just as there are eight Beatitudes at the beginning of our Lord's ministry. This is the end. This is his last public statement. So eight blessings at the beginning, and with many manuscripts, eight woes at the end. In some manuscripts, seven, and our versions today follow the seven, right or wrong. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea. They're missionaries, but they're missionaries of evil. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. You know, in the Rwanda massacres, most of the murderers were churchgoers. And the people came to their pastors on, on the Sabbath and said, is it all right to kill today? How come? Because missionaries had indoctrinated without converting. And so nearly a million religionists were slaughtered by other religionists in just one country in your lifetime and mine. Twice as much a child of hell. What does your religion make of you? A child of hell? How do you speak? How do you think? How do you do? Woe to you blind guides, you say if anyone swears by the temple. And then you have verses of casuistry, ridiculous philosophical religious laws that have no sense whatever, just casuistry. Come down to verse 23. Woe to you, teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill and cumin, 
that you've neglected the more important matters of the Lord, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practised these without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. Did Jesus have a sense of humour? Well, picture the scene. He pictures the Pharisees as using a bit of Muslim cloth to strain the water before they drink it in case there's a gnat in it because the gnat's unclean. But so is a camel unclean. So he pictures, picture one, Pharisee is straining through a Muslim cloth, the water to get out a gnat, so microscopic you can't see it. And then next picture, he's trying to digest a camel. Did our Lord have a sense of humour? Of course, he gave you yours. Notice how important the preceding verses are. You pay mint, you pay tithe of parsley and mint. Garden herbs. You know, some Americans are listening to us, so if Americans are listening, you must say herbs. You must not say herbs. Okay. So these Pharisees, they paid tithe on all their herbs. <laughs> but they omitted the weightier matters of the law. Justice, mercy, faith. Now please observe the main point in this chapter. You can tell pharisaical religion because it majors in minors. It deals mostly with externals, you know, with some denominations. In this country you can marry with a wedding ring, but in America you, you, until a few years ago you couldn't. Majors in externals and reveres the past, the traditions of the past. Not the scriptures of the past, the traditions of the past. So these are the marks of bad religion. Majors and minors, strain out a gnat, swallow a camel. Deals with externals. Don't let that person come to church, he's got a nose ring. Send him home. We don't want uh, sneakers here. And he never came back again. And reverence for the past traditions. So Jesus will go on to say about them building the tombs of the men that they had murdered. Look please at verse 29. You hypocrites, you build tombs for the prophets, you decorate the graves of the righteous, you say, if we'd lived in the days of our forefathers, we wouldn't have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. And Jesus said, yes, you would. So here they revered the past. Listen, in Abraham's day, they said, oh, Adam was a great man, but we don't know Abraham. In Moses' day, they said, Abraham was a great man, but we don't know this Moses. In the days of Samuel, they said Moses was a great man, but we don't know to this Samuel. And in the days of Jesus, they said all the past prophets were good men, but we don't know this Jesus. The marks of Pharisaism, majors in minors, deals mainly with externals, the tassels, the phylacteries, whitewashing the tomb. A lot of religion today is whitewashed, you know that, don't you? A lot of religion today is just sheer whitewash. I could think of one or two very popular names, but I'm not sure whether Radio Rima would like me to mention them, so I better not. But a lot of modern religion is whitewash. And the third thing about bad religion is it majors in the traditions of the past and won't accept the truth of the past. Now notice, please, 33. And our Lord is really warming up. But there were tears in his voice. Our Lord did rebuke evil, but he never rebuked evil without tears. When I rebuke evil, there aren't any tears. I want that guy to feel the pain. That shows how unchristian I am at that point. Because when our Lord rebuked, there were tears. And there were tears when he said these things. You snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? Now notice the surprising words that follow and ask, who is this? Oh, you say, that's easy. It's a young man in his early 30s from Nazareth. No, there's more than that. Note, 
I am sending you prophets. Now, the man who says this is going to be dead within three days, three or four days. I'm sending you prophets and wise men and teachers. Some of them you'll kill and crucify. Others you'll flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that's been shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. I tell you the truth, all this will come upon this generation. What is he saying? He's saying, by your present decision to murder me and my followers, you make yourself guilty of all past martyrdoms, beginning with Abel, the first martyr, and ending with Zechariah's, Remember, that's recorded in Second Chronicles, which is the final book of the Old Testament scriptures in Hebrew. The Bible they had had the story of the murder of Zechariah in the last book. So he says, all these martyrs are recorded in scripture because you have murder in your hearts, God is going to count that you are guilty of their blood. We find this idea repeated in the closing chapters of Revelation in connection with the martyrdoms of the last generation of Christians when apostate religion and apostate government unite to put to death those who won't conform. And you find this same admonition there. Stern words, but all of them are words of love because God is trying to save these sinners, not lose them. Now we'll look at the saddest words perhaps our Lord ever uttered. The closing words of 23rd chapter. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you are not willing. Look, your house has left you desolate. I tell you, you'll not see me again till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now let me ask you, who is this that speaks as though he lives from eternity? I sent you prophets, 2,000 years of prophets. I will send you prophets, another 2,000 years. How often would I have gathered you? Israel had been in existence for nearly 1,500 years as a corporate structure. Young man in his early 30s talking about that he wanted to gather Israel and all the preceding centuries. That he, the young carpenter, was the one who had sent the prophets to Israel. And he's speaking as a judge. Your house is left unto you desolate. But look at the love in it. How often would I have gathered your children as a hen gathers her chickens? Now, no man would like to be thought of in terms of being a hen. You can call him a lion if you like, he doesn't mind that. But don't call him a snake and don't call him a hen. But God can liken God to a hen. Why? Because all motherless, motherliness has its origin in the heart of God. That's very, very important for us to understand. Man and woman together picture what God is by nature. Man and woman at their best. Motherliness. You know, I owe a great deal to certain women in my past whom I think of as very, very old ladies, though they were younger than I am. Now, but I owe a great deal to some very kind old ladies of my boyhood and young manhood. I owe them so much. There wasn't much affection in my home, but I found real affection in Christian women of some age. But the motherliness that makes women so important, because if women were the presidents of countries, we wouldn't have so many wars. 
Can you imagine women as a group doing what happened in World War II when often they said, don't take any prisoners. And when the winners went around with little hammers knocking the gold teeth of the Japanese to get out their gold while the man was still alive, would women have done that? Would women have done what the Germans did at the Battle of the Bulge when they catch one group of a hundred Americans? Shoot them down. Take no prisoners. Motherliness is a reflection in the heart of a woman of the love in the heart of God. And so when Christ says, how often would I have gathered you as a hen? It's because he's God. And he's not only fatherly with courage, he's motherly with compassion. And if he'd said this about good people, we'd still be very impressed that God should love good people like this. But he's saying it about rascals. He's saying it about villains. How often I'd have gathered you, you murderers, you hypocrites. I want you as a hen wants to save her chicks. I'm sure you've heard the story of a man going through a, the rubble after a house had burnt down, a farm, farming house, and he kicks a mound and he does so a lot of chickens run out. And his companion look closer and they say, hey, what we thought was a mound of rubbish, that was the mother hen. And she's sheltered all the chicks from the fire. She's died, but they're okay. So it's a wonderful picture of God, the motherliness of God and his love for the unlovely. You know, there are times when we see ourselves as we are or somewhat as we are. And it's not a very comforting picture. But the good news of the Bible is God loves the unlovely. That's the only thing that can give us hope. You know, when Queen Elizabeth was quite old, she had all the mirrors taken down in the palace. For that, mirrors were everywhere, a sign of opulence. But when she got old and haggard looking, she commanded all the mirrors come down. But life has a series of mirrors, and from time to time, we get a glimpse of what we are. And it can be very discouraging, it can be very disheartening, but the good news of the Bible is that God loves the ugly. God loves the unlovely. How often would I have gathered you murderers? How often would I have gathered you hypocrites? And ye would not. What a picture. What a picture. Then he refers to his return in glory. And remember, he's going to be crucified in a few days. You'll not see me again until you say, blessed is he. He is coming again but they're going to murder him. How could it be? Because he'll ra be raised from the dead. You know, we don't have to be as weak as we are. Paul says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. It is your privilege and mine in all our weakness to call upon God and ask for the power of his incarnation, the power of his crucifixion. It took a lot of power to submit to that when he could have withered his crucifiers. The power of his resurrection, the power of his ascension, it's all there for weak Christians if we'll call upon him and trust him. So he says, I am coming again despite what you do. Now we're going to look at Matthew 24. This is a storm centre of exegesis and most that's written on it is not worth much. It's a very, very important chapter. Let's read a few verses and then we'll begin to look at its meaning. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. You see all these things, he asked. I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. So as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, tell us, when will this happen? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? And Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceive you. Many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, deceive many. You'll hear of wars, rumours of wars. See to it you're not alarmed, such things must happen. The end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. 
There'll be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pangs. Then you'll be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. You'll be hated by all nations because of me. And at that time many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. That's believers. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel and let the reader understand then flee for then shall be tribulation such as never was from the beginning of the world or ever shall be. What shall we say about this sermon? Exegetes are bewildered. Does it fit the destruction of Jerusalem only? Does it fit the end of the world only? Does it fit the destruction of Jerusalem as a type of the end of the world? Or are they both fused together so that when the disciples said, tell us, what's the sign of the end of the world? And you're coming. Did he answer that question? I should first of all point out that this chapter is an elaboration of the themes of the book of Daniel. The most influential Old Testament book at the time of Christ was the book of Daniel. I've been intrigued by it for about 70 years. I've written three books on it. And every time I study it, I learn more. And someone will say, hey, you wrote this in the 1960s or the 1970s. I said, yes, but I've learnt a little since then. <laughs> yeah. The book of Daniel was the most influential book in Christ's day and its themes were the kingdom of heaven, the Antichrist known as the abomination of desolation and the last great tribulation, greater than anything in the past, greater than anything could ever happen in the future. So these were the themes, plus one other. I saw one like the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. Messiah the Prince, who shall be cut off. So these are the themes of Daniel, the Kingdom of God, the Last Great Tribulation, the Antichrist and the Christ. They are all used by our Lord Jesus and they are all present in this chapter. He'll talk about, in verse 15, the Antichrist, known as the Abomination of Desolation. The Jews called Daniel by that title, just as they called Genesis Bereshith, which is the first Hebrew word of the book. In this chapter, we'll read about the Son of Man coming in glory, as in Daniel 7.13. In this chapter, we'll read about the last great tribulation. That's discussed from 15 down to about 24. All the great themes of Daniel are to be found here. But particularly Christ is interpreting Daniel 9, 24 to 27. So I invite you please to turn to that passage. Daniel, remember, in the middle of your <coughs> Bible you have Psalms and after Psalms you have the major prophets and the minor prophets and we're looking at what follows Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel and we're going to look at the ninth chapter. from 24 to 27 is one of the most magnificent prophecies that's ever been given. It alone is sufficient to prove that the whole Bible is an inspired book. It alone is sufficient to prove that Jesus is the true Christ and our only Redeemer and our only hope. It's a prophecy that foretells the destruction of Jerusalem which happened 40 years after they crucified Christ and it's a prophecy that foretells the crucifixion of Christ which is the cause of the destruction of Jerusalem and its temple. <coughs> so look now, Daniel 9, 24-27. 77, your version may say weeks. The Hebrew word is sevens. Whenever it's used for weeks in the Old Testament it adds of days. That's not found here. 
70 sevens because there's a lot of symbolism in that and we'll look at it, some of it. 77s are decreed for your people and your holy city, Jerusalem, to finish transgression, put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness. Hey, this is talking about the wiping out of the world's sin, your sin, my sin. It's talking about the hour when that would happen, when your sin and mine, our sins of committal and our sins of omission, Many a person says, hey, I don't do this, I don't do that, I'm all right. But God said, well, what have you done that's right? We sin by not doing as well as by doing. But here's a prophecy about atoning for wickedness and bringing in everlasting righteousness. Hey, that's what I need. I can't face the great judge without that. I don't have it in myself. I've got a lot of crookedness in here, a lot of badness in here. A lot of selfishness and pride and iniquity in here. I don't have everlasting righteousness, but I must have it. I can't face the great judge without it. But it's going to be brought in, brought in from outside. Bring in everlasting righteousness. Seal up vision and prophecy. Fulfill all that the Bible's foretold. And to anoint, it should be a most holy. The D is not there in the Hebrew. To anoint the Messiah. He was the most holy. No one understand this. Please observe, that's what Christ referred to when he said, whoso readeth, let him understand. By the way, in case I forget, <coughs> about 50 years ago, I was very intrigued by this verse. And I was very intrigued by what a lady commentator had written about it. That what happened when the Roman armies with their idolatrous ensigns came against Jerusalem, was a symbol of what would happen at the end of the world, when there'd be a worldwide idolatry that would lead to the final destruction of the world. So I went to Manchester University with the idea of writing a thesis on this, on the abomination of desolation. But when I began to look for books on the topic, because he that never reads will never be read. He that doesn't quote will never be quoted. He who doesn't use other men's brains shows he's got no brains of his own. So I looked for books on this topic. I did not find one. Great Manchester Library. I went to the Cambridge Library. I went to the Library of the University of Oxford. I went to the Library in London. And then finally, being called to America on another purpose, I went to the Library of Congress. Not one book. But did not Jesus say, whoever reads about this abomination, make sure you understand it. Well, how come we haven't tried? So I wrote a book on it, whatever it's worth. It was printed by the University Press of America. It's in many seminary libraries. It was done quite quickly because Jill knew a lot knew German a lot better than me. The book has in it Hebrew, Greek, a little bit of English, Dutch, etc. German. But Jill knew German a lot better than me and, and she knew French. I didn't know anything about French. I had an idea that Paris had something to do with it. <laughs> That's all. So I wrote the one book in the world on the topic. Wouldn't you think there'd be thousands? So we're going to look at it a bit. See, over and over in the book of Daniel, you have the theme of the persecution of the people of God by the people of Satan. The book opens with Jerusalem attacked, the temple being wasted, the saints trodden down. That's how the book opens. And that's the theme of all the visions and all the prophecies. And I'd been studying Daniel for 30 years before I learnt that the stories were the keys to the prophecies. Because all the stories picture images of Antichrist, Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, so on. What characterised them? Pride, idolatry, persecution. These are all the elements of Antichrist. And what do they do? They're laying waste the saints. Throw them into a burning fiery furnace, etc., etc. So when you come to the visions, you have the same thing. The saints will be trodden down, 2,300 evening mornings. Abomination of desolation will prevail. 
But now notice this chapter, chapter 9. Know and understand from the issuing of the decree to restore and build Jerusalem. Remember this book is written when Jerusalem is desolate, when the Israelites are in Babylonian captivity. But they're to go out and it's to be rebuilt. Until the anointed one, that's just the same word as Christ. Some translations use the word Christ there. There'll be seven sevens and 62 sevens. It'll be rebuilt with streets and a trench. But in times of trouble, after 62 sevens, the anointed one will be cut off. The Christ will be cut off and will have nothing. Very mysterious Hebrew passage. We'll have nothing. Literally it means there will be nothing to him. The city is not his. His people are not his. Life is not his. He's got nothing. He's cut off. What's the result of that? The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. There's the result of the cutting off of the Messiah. Jerusalem, where he'll be crucified, will be destroyed. The temple, where he's rejected, will be burnt to the ground because of the murder of the Son of God. Don't ever miss the connection there. Messiah will be cut off and will have nothing this is verse 26. But the people of the rule will come, will destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end will come like a flood. War will continue to the end. Desolations have been decreed. And would you notice in the last half of the next verse, on a wing of the temple will be set up an abomination of desolation. That's how the Septuagint translates it. An abomination that causes desolation. Till the end this decreed is poured out on him. So, pagan Rome was a, an abomination of desolation when it destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. But the centuries that followed, there'd be bad religion that was idolatrous and persecuting. That would be another form of the abomination of desolation. And then finally, at the end of time, the final form of Antichrist, when church and state unite, set up an idolatrous system and all who won't conform are threatened with martyrdom. All of that is comprehended in these verses. Why does it use sevens? Well, there are several reasons. Much prophecy is what scholars call apotelismatic, apotelismatic, which means has more than one fulfilment. God's people, before Christ came, understood this passage as warning about Antiochus Epiphanes, who came and damaged Jerusalem and murdered 40,000 Jews. And this prophecy is so worded that God's ancient people, before Christ came, could get warnings from it. And the people of Christ's day could get warnings from it. And the people after Christ's day. And the people at the end of the world. So it uses seven as a symbolic unit rather than tying it down to just seven years as such. And yet it is true that in approximately 70 weeks of years after the Messiah came, he was cut off and then 40 years after that the temple was burnt to the ground when Jerusalem was destroyed. Well, back to Matthew 24 for a minute or two before we have a break. Please look again at verse 14. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a witness unto all nations. Then the end will come. But when you see standing in the holy place the abomination of desolation that causes desolation, spoken of through Daniel, understand it, flee, for then will be great tribulation. Two big things. The gospels go to all the world, the gospel of Christ, the risen Christ, the crucified Christ. But Antichrist will threaten all the world, the abomination of desolation. These two things happen together. You know, when you come to the end of New Testament history with the destruction of Christ, you also have Pentecost. And the last days of Christ typify the last days, the end of the world, the last days of his church. So Christ had his triumphal entry that polarised the world the opposing religious bodies got together, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, and linked with the government, Pilate. 
to pass a death decree against Christ. And there's apostasy in Christ's ranks. Judas becomes an abomination of desolation, betraying his Lord with a kiss. Then there's a little time of trouble in Gethsemane and the great time of trouble on the cross. All that prefigures the end of the world. The gospel will go to all the world like Christ's triumphant entry. It'll polarise the world. But Antichrist, at the same time, is threatening those who will not conform to his gospel. And so a death decree will go out. It'll give a time of trouble such as never was to the saints of God. But this wonderful prophecy is so written it would help the church in all ages. That's why it uses sevens and it should not be translated weeks. Though some versions give you weeks because that's a traditional view. Right, we're back to Matthew 24 just for a minute or so. When you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation. See, they said, what will be the sign of your coming? He said, well, there'll be wars and rumours of wars. There'll be famines, there'll be earthquakes, there'll be pestilences, there'll be religious persecution, but none of them is the sign. The sign is Antichrist. When Antichrist stands up with all his idolatry, with all his threat to desolate, to persecute, then you know the end is near. That's what he's telling them. So we're going to take a little break and then we'll think a little more about this. Thank you.